Hi everyone. Thanks for attending this session. Uh, my name is Rama Chavali. I am software engineer at uh, Salesforce Service Mesh team. I've been with Salesforce for past six years and working on mesh related technologies for close to five, five and a half years. And I have with me my colleague Devesh. Hey everyone, this is Devesh here. Uh, I've been employed with Salesforce for the last four years. I've been working on service mesh technologies for about three and a half years, and I'm happy to present the drama today. All right. So today, uh, our agenda is going to be like we want to focus on a little bit on Salesforce issue adoption journey. And more specifically, um, we have adopted uh, uh, HBase, Cassandra, and cloud provider managed services like Elastic Cache, Postgres database. So we are going to share our experiences, uh, how we have used Istio's latest features to configure these services. And I'm going to spend a little bit of uh, time uh, <coughs> covering what are the things that are we are looking at uh, Istio in future, basically. And we are going to wrap up with Q&A. So coming to Salesforce uh, Istio adoption, to just give you a brief background of uh, Salesforce service mesh journey. We started in early 2017. Or, uh, we built uh, Salesforce in-house control plane based on the Envoy XDS APIs when they arrived in uh, late December uh, 2017. And we have onboarded uh, a lot of uh, HTTP gRPC services onto them. So it has been running very well, serving these needs for uh, the HTTP and gRPC services. But in 2018, Salesforce uh, pivoted to public cloud. Uh, so at that point, we have decided to evaluate uh, other open source options so that we can serve a wider range of services in a better way. So we picked Istio at that point in time. So this is our early adoption to Istio. Our first step was to migrate uh, the existing gRPC HTTP services from our native control, our in-house control plane to Istio. So as they are pretty simple in nature, we were able to uh, migrate them pretty smoothly. And this has helped us to prove that Istio at Salesforce works and works really well. And once HTTP gRPC services uh, have been adopted, we then just uh, picked TCP services. And then we onboarded a lot of TCP services uh, onto mesh. Uh, while we were adopting these services, our focus has always been on ease of adoption. So by ease of adoption, I mean a service owner has to do very little change or configuration at his end to make his service work on mesh. So with the experience of running the in-house control plane, as well as running Istio at scale, uh, we have come up with an opinionated set of uh, configurations for really complicated use cases like uh, timeouts, for example, outlet detection, circuit breaking. So we apply this uh, opinionated configuration to all the services that come on to mesh by default so that they don't have to think, think about what should me, be my timeout be, basically, right? So that was our early adoption. It was around 2018 and part of 2019. So we have seen a huge uh, success with Istio, uh, moving a lot of services onto mesh, primarily catering to TCP services, HTTP services, and addressing zero trust requirements. And this year, uh, we have decided that we will move to uh, complicated uh, use cases. Uh, so one of our goals was to onboard several complex uh, OSS tags like HBase, Elastic Cache, Cassandra, onto Mesh. 
so uh, to onboard these services multi cluster istio is a prerequisite that is because we want to have isolated clusters for data stores so that they run in restricted clusters with least privileges i am going to explain about our multi cluster journey in a bit but multi cluster istio was a prerequisite to onboard these services as these services are coming on to mesh they also have integrations with uh, cloud provider managed services like elastic cache postgres database so the service owners have expressed interest to make these calls via mesh so we have uh, uh, adopted we have helped service owners to adopt mesh for these use cases as well so we are going to talk about uh, all of these uh, three use cases in detail Uh, with how we configure uh, with uh, demonstrations as well recently uh, we have experimented with some of the wasm related use cases and we have built uh, some wasm filters uh, for fraud defense uh, security use cases primarily and we are happy to share that we went live recently with these uh, filters and i'm going to end up with uh, what are the future initiatives that we are looking at istio and what is in store for uh, later part of this year and coming years at salesforce so now coming to multi cluster adoption uh, some of the driving use cases for Ichi for salesforce to adopt multi cluster are uh, as i was telling in the last slide data stores in isolated clusters like for example if you look at hbase and cassandra uh, the requirement is the actual data is stored in a restricted cluster with least privileges and clients access uh, from other clusters so we had to build a multi cluster solution to meet this need before we onboard these services onto mesh at the same time uh, with a lot of service growth Uh, we are seeing a lot of services are coming on to mesh and we are slowly hitting kubernetes uh, cluster limits in terms of node pools uh, etc so we had to build a multi cluster solution to cater to this need and third and important one of the other important use cases is high availability let's say for example a service is running in uh, a cluster and service owners want their service to be highly available uh, even if the cluster in which they are running goes down so we have uh, adopted the multi cluster to address this use case as well so out of all the istio deployment models we have chosen uh, primary remote as the model of choice for us to deploy multi cluster that is primarily because it is simple to operate and operationally a uh, lot easier to monitor basically so if you look at the diagram on the right side it explains our deployment model uh, we have two clusters here uh, one is uh, one we what we call as a primary kubernetes cluster which hosts istio d and there is a remote kubernetes cluster all uh, both of these clusters are connected via flat network so services uh, in both these clusters can talk to each other seamlessly without worrying about uh, where are they deployed actually so the istio d component running in the primary cluster manages uh, the endpoint and service uh, reconciliation talking to both the api servers and uh, services can be deployed in uh, both the clusters so here if you see in the example service b is deployed in the remote cluster uh, and service d a is striped across uh, two clusters uh, to address the high availability use case basically so service b when it uh, wants to invoke service a it just can a uh, invoke it with a simple url and uh, istio manages to route the calls to cross cluster 
and similarly if uh, a cluster goes down service b can still continue to access service a although with uh, reduced uh, capacity and we use uh, istio dns as the underlying class cluster di discovery mechanism uh, and from our deployment perspective uh, we have automated uh, the complete uh, remote cluster setup so uh, let's say for example if i want to add a new cluster to this deployment we have de automated that via spinnaker so if you run the spinnaker pipeline it brings up a new cluster automatically so and, and configures mesh and once mesh is configured we have uh, in house uh, config generation tools that watch remote clusters and generate the necessary istio configuration like virtual service and destination rules uh, sidecars whatever is necessary to onboard uh, that service onto mesh basically so that way this the whole multi cluster setup is seamless and automated and now i am going to switch over to the crux of this ses session which is basically advanced use cases so we are going to talk about three use cases today uh, one is hbase another one is cassandra a third one is uh, cloud provider managed services on my goal of this uh, slide is to explain the challenges that we have uh, faced while onboarding these services uh, and how we worked with istio community to fix those issues and first one is the hbase as i explained earlier it needed multi cluster deployment so we have uh, fixed some of the issues in istio multi cluster to make the whole multi cluster work uh, properly and one of the challenges uh, in hbase was hbase uses uh, a tcp stateful sets to model uh, all of its components like name node zookeeper uh, so istio dns was uh, lacking support for uh, stateful sets so we we have enhanced uh, istio to add uh, that support and hbase uses tproxy extensively for a couple of its services mainly name node and uh, zookeeper so the tproxy mode is used to get the original source ip and the soft name node and zookeeper have some authentication and valid, uh, connection pooling built into them based on the original source ip so we have had issues with uh, istio tproxy mode specifically in the case where uh, a pod needs to call itself so again we have uh, worked with istio community to fix that issue and we were able to onboard hbase successfully and now coming to cassandra uh, the features that we have built for multi, multi cluster for hbase we were able to leverage the same for cassandra and same with cross cluster dns so since uh, cassandra also is based on stateful sets we were able to make use of the fixes we made for hbase and onboard cassandra so one of the important use cases of cassandra here is uh, uh, at salesforce is cassandra is running already on uh, non mesh uh, which we call legacy cassandra instance and we are moving to mesh based cassandra so there is a period of time where Uh, the legacy cassandra instances need to talk to mesh cassandra instances and coordinate uh, the data across both so we had to support this uh, data migration use case uh, devish in his uh, talk is going to explain uh, how we have solved this use case and demonstrate that in detail and coming to cloud provider managed services one of the challenges we have faced we have faced is uh, we have modeled these uh, cloud provider managed the services as external services using service entry and in some cases service entry is shared the same port and at that point we were hitting uh, listener conflict errors uh, 
uh, in Istio. So we have made use of uh, DNS auto allocate feature. Again, we have contributed some of the fixes to auto allocate feature. And with the help of community, uh, we got it working. So we cur currently make use of it to resolve this uh, use case, basically. So at this point, I would like to highlight the help uh, that uh, Istio community has provided the openness and the timely help uh, the community has provided to solve these complicated use cases uh, without which we wouldn't have been able to onboard them and uh, so successfully. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Devesh to take you through these uh, three use cases in detail, how we configure them and give a demo of all of these uh, use cases. Over to you, Devish. Thanks, Rama. <clears throat> so coming out of the first use case uh, with EdgePace, uh, the Hadoop ecosystem that we run at Salesforce um, runs in a remote Kubernetes cluster where the clients may run in the primary uh, Kubernetes cluster or may have clients in the very same cluster for peer-to-peer uh, peer -peer communication to happen. Now, all Hadoop components, uh, they are uh, deployed as TCP stateful sets with a headless Kubernetes service. And the clients typically use a cluster agnostic uh, calling pattern that looks something like started service or cluster or local uh, to interact uh, with each of the components. And uh, uh, in being able to do so, the client necessarily does not need to know if the components are running in the same cluster or in a different cluster, since the service or cluster or local pattern is very commonly used uh, uh, for within the same Kubernetes cluster communication between services. And uh, additionally, we are using the proxy interception mode, as Rama mentioned, uh, for uh, Zookeeper and Namer components for maintaining the original source IP. Now, jumping onto the demo for, so in this demo, we're basically gonna showcase one of the components of the Hadoop ecosystem, which is Zookeeper. So what you see over here basically is a headless Kubernetes service that we're deploying, which is called Zookeeper, and it's got cluster IP set to none. And you can see the standard set of uh, Zookeeper ports that are listed out here for the cluster IP service. Now, once the service is deployed, we deploy the stateful set, which is running with three replicas over here. And uh, essentially, it's the same service name that is tied to the stateful set, uh, the headless service that we spoke about. And you can see that we're using sidecar injection annotation over here for Istio, as well as the interception mode set to T proxy. Um, so with that, the last piece of configuration is the config map, where you basically essentially look at uh, the uh, Zookeeper code, which is uh, each of the individual uh, node addresses basically that is used for part-to-part uh, -part communication. Uh, so since the three uh, node uh, Zookeeper instance, you can see Zookeeper 0, 1, and 2 listed out. Now, here I'm basically on the Zookeeper 0 node. And uh, what I'm going to try to do is use ZKCLI to basically connect to one of the peer nodes, uh, which is Zookeeper 1. And I'll be connecting on port 2181. So the moment I uh, hit this connection endpoint, uh, th this connection URL, what you can see is that it shows that it's able to connect successfully on Zookeeper one. And on the other tab, you can see the snippet from the Istio DNS log, where the question section basically shows the uh, address Zookeeper one address that was being uh, asked to resolve, and it points to the ten dot ninety six IP address. Now, what the 10.96 IP, now in terms of the routing configuration on the Istio side, Istio creates uh, an outbound listener, uh, which is pod IP underscore port based. And that has a TCP proxy filter that then points to an outbound uh, 2181 Envoy cluster. And uh, what the outbound 2181 uh, Envoy cluster is actually is an original DST cluster created because of deploying a headless service. And additionally, you can see all the regular stuff, which has the upstream TLS context for MTLS communication to happen. So uh, with this routing configuration in place, uh, moving back to the demo, now that I'm able to connect to the peer node successfully using a CDNS, uh, uh, and this routing configuration, I'll basically use the create command to uh, create a, a, a test node with values at test, test value. And then in the next command, I'll basically use query the same test node. And it returns the same value that I set in the previous command. And that sums up the demo for uh, Zookeeper. Now, jumping to the second use case, which is Cassandra. Uh, we deploy a multi-node Cassandra uh, as a Kubernetes stateful set, similar to, Zookie, uh, similar to Zookeeper and the other Hadoop ecosystem uh, components. And it has a headless Kubernetes service as well. 
and individual nodes of Cassandra, they are accessed uh, using the stateful said uh, node name dot the service name dot namespace dot service dot cluster dot local, and uh, uh, there is data node sync that happens between uh, uh, Cassandra nodes which are not on mesh uh, with uh, they wanting to communicate with uh, uh, the Cassandra nodes which are running on mesh. And uh, so that's like one of the use cases which we'll be covering up later on, and I'll be showcasing in the demo as to how we're able to achieve that. Now, so th so that set is like one set of client that talks to the mesh-based Cassandra instance, but there are other uh, wide variety of uh, clients as well, some of them which may be running on Kubernetes, and uh, some of them may even be running on uh, bare metal VMs. And uh, one of the basic requirements uh, for all these various clients that talk to the mesh-based Cassandra instances is that they should be able to communicate using the same set of standard ports, and we're not exposing new ports just just for uh, just in order to facilitate this. And uh, we're very easily able to achieve this using uh, the Istio configuration that we deploy. Now, in the first demo, basically, I'll be showcasing uh, a standard installation of Cassandra, uh, which we are running as a three-node cluster. And uh, uh, what you see over here basically is uh, that we are deploying uh, a headless uh, 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 Kubernetes service over here, which is called a standard remote. And uh, that runs in, uh, so essentially this mesh-based Cassandra instance is going to run in a, a different Kubernetes cluster from where the client is running to showcase the multi-cluster use case. So as you can see, the service, it's a headless service with cluster IP set to none. And uh, it's called standard remote. That's the name of the headless service. And it's listing out all the standard uh, Cassandra uh, ports uh, uh, that you typically see in any installation out there. And uh, once the service is deployed, you have your stateful set, which is called standard remote as well. And uh, it has the Kubernetes service uh, tied to it, uh, the headless service, which I, which I showcased before this. And you can see the sidecar injection annotation, which is enabled. And uh, here I'm showcasing some of the environment variables we, con we configure for Cassandra. So one is the Cassandra seed nodes, seed no see, uh, Cassandra seeds, which is listing out each of the uh, the address of each of the uh, Cassandra nodes that are part of the three node cluster. And in terms of the other addresses, the RPC address is set to wildcard IP, uh, and then the listen address, the broadcast ad broadcast address, and the broadcast RPC address they're set to uh, the pod IP. Now, the last piece of configuration that we need for installation is deployment of the sidecar resource, uh, which is applied on uh, the inbound side. And essentially, we are setting the default endpoint to be wildcard call in each of those ports. And this is to uh, uh, accommodate the changes that were introduced in the Istio networking in 1.10. And uh, so once this particular sidecar resource is deployed, uh, what I'm going to be showcasing next is uh, uh, this is a snippet of the config dump. So uh, as you can see that for the standard remote two node, uh, I'm querying the config dump and I'm showing the cluster ID and it points to this cluster called SAM restricted one. And uh, if I exec into the Cassandra container for this particular uh, standard remote two uh, pod uh, and run uh, no tool status, uh, what you'll basically see is uh, the three node cluster uh, that is up and running. So, so it shows the three-node cluster is so healthy. So that's how we know that uh, the, 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 there is no split brain that is happening between the Cassandra nodes and they're able to communicate successfully. Now, on the other side is this client that I'm using, which is also another Cassandra installation, but it's running in a different cluster, and it's called standard. And as you can see, the cluster ID is different over here. It's a SAM processing one. And uh, what I'm going to do basically is uh, I'm, I've exec into that uh, one of the nodes of the standard inst installation, which runs in the processing cluster. And I'll use ZK CLI, uh, sorry, uh, CQ, uh, CQ, uh, CQLSH basically to connect to the uh, remote installation of Cassandra. And as you can see, it shows that I'm able to successfully connect to it on port 9043. And then this is the snippet from uh, the Istio DNS log that uh, shows that it's basically trying to resolve. Uh, the remote cluster address, uh, which is based on service cluster local, and the DNS is able to return the 10.112 address. So once uh, the resolution works and it's able to connect successfully, uh, what I'm basically going to do is run a couple of standard SQL SH uh, commands over here. So the first one is basically I'm going to create a key space, which I call as test key space. And uh, once I've created the key space, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, try to create a table under the key space, which is called as an employee table. 
And uh, once I've created the employee table, I can run select star from EMP basically to uh, query the employee table. So that's how the cross cluster communication works. The client is able to communicate uh, with the remote installation of uh, Cassandra successfully using a state DNS. Now, building on top of this demo is uh, the last use case for Cassandra, which is the data migration one, where the Cassandra instance, which is not running on mesh, may want to communicate with what running on mesh. And for, in order to facilitate that, what we do is we deploy this Envoy filter for the remote uh, the Cassandra installation. And what this Envoy filter is doing, it's, it's applying a patch on the virtual inbound listener. Um, and uh, what the patch basically says is that we are adding these extra filter chain rules. And we are basically saying that if the destination port, let's say, is 9043, and if the traffic is coming from any of these uh, source IPs, then essentially it points to a TCP proxy filter that then points to an inbound pass-through cluster. And that's how uh, non-mesh based clients are able to communicate uh, for our use case on the very same ports. And we're able to handle that very easily with uh, Istio routing. And uh, here I'm basically going to do is, uh, so this is, so CIDA 0 is basically one of the nodes, uh, uh, the client which is not running on mesh, uh, the Cassandra installation, and it's using SQL SH basically to connect to uh, the same Cassandra uh, instance that we'd used in the previous demo, which is standard remote. And then uh, what I can do is, now that I'm able to successfully connect to it, I'll basically use the same key space that I'd uh, created in the previous demo. And I can query the same employee table that was created uh, under the same key space. And that basically shows uh, that we're able to facilitate communication between non-mesh-based Cassandra with uh, mesh-based Cassandra. Now, the last use case is for the cloud provider managed services. Now, for cloud provider managed services uh, such as Elastic Cache or Redis, service owners are essentially able to create a service entry with additional configuration, as, which is provided as annotation. And uh, our config generation tool basically processes the service entry and the annotation on the service entry to generate the required virtual service and destination rule, essentially a still routing configuration in order to uh, make the, the non-managed service basically available to any mesh client. And some of the benefits of this model uh, being, uh, well, the first is the client side telemetry that comes for free, uh, uh, that the, the, the customer does not essentially need to do anything explicit to get, get access to their free client side telemetry, which we'll shortly see in the demo. And secondly is the support for simple TLS, uh, which comes uh, out of the box with uh, running a state proxy on the client side. And uh, this is done in a completely self-serve manner for our customers, uh, and there is no involvement of any mesh admin over here. Now, <clears throat> jumping onto the demo for this, what you see over here is a sample service entry uh, that we are basically deploying that actually has uh, the Redis endpoint, which is redacted over here, and this it's exposing port 6380. And this is the logical address, which is Redis external service that the mesh client will use to connect to uh, the Redis installation. Now that translates to uh, once the service entry and the routing configuration is deployed, uh, what you see is uh, what the client sees in, the, in its config dump. And essentially this is an outbound listener with pod IP. It's not the pod IP, but it's uh, the, one of the 240 star addresses that's created because of usage of uh, DNS auto allocate feature. So it's it's the IP underscore port listener that is created over here, and that ha that points to a Redis proxy filter, and the Redis proxy filter then points to the outbound six three eight zero on by cluster, which will be of type strict DNS. Uh, so and additionally is uh, you you see some additional authentication related configuration that we deploy through on by filter. Um, so that's from the listener configuration and. Uh, for the strict DNS cluster itself, uh, you can see that uh, the upstream TLS context is configured over here to handle simple TLS. And uh, uh, apart from that, you can also see the, uh, some additional configuration over here for the Redis proxy filter, which is needed to uh, support authentication uh, um, in order to make the authentication work uh, with the managed Redis instance. Now, over here, I'm actually, I've exit into a pod which has Redis CLI uh, installed in one of the containers, and I'm basically using the same logical endpoint to connect to this managed uh, Redis instance. And as you can see, I'm able to successfully set a key and the corresponding value. And the next command, I'll basically query the, connect to the same instance and basically get the same key. And it, as you can see, it returns the value that was set in the first command, which is test value. 
and uh, lastly the i'll run the delete command to delete the key uh, since it's a borrowed redis instance and uh, now that we've deleted the key uh, as mentioned earlier uh, uh, the mesh client basically gets free telemetry for uh, for this and as you can see like the redis proxy filter generates the get set and delete uh, uh, stats over here in this particular scenario and that pretty much sums up the last use case and handing it back to rama thank you devesh uh, for that wonderful demo so i'm going to co cover some of the future initiatives that we are looking at uh, solving uh, this year and coming year uh, so with the growth that we are seeing uh, in terms of number of services coming on to mesh number of installations of mesh uh, we have to focus on scale and have a high availability of uh, mesh so while high availability has been on the forefront of our thoughts right from the beginning some of the corner cases like um, uh, withstanding uh, primary cluster failure where istio control plane is uh, deployed uh, we want to solve that use case uh, and ensure uh, control plane is highly available across uh, cluster uh, failures basically and on the scale front uh, we want to support better support for larger meshes so some of the initiatives that we are thinking uh, this here is optimized config delivery uh, using delta xds istio is already uh, has support for it so we want to try it out we have been contributing to delta xds feature uh, so we want to try that out and uh, as an experimental feature this year and with the number of proxies uh, in the mesh uh, we want to make control plane efficient in handling more number of proxies per control plane instance so that we don't run a battery of instance uh, control plane instances so here again uh, we are working with istio community on some of the initiatives like uh, reducing memory footprint using xds cache and then uh, initiatives on uh, reducing the cpu utilization of uh, control plane and another important dimension we are looking at is the proxy initialization times with the number of services growing in the cluster uh, our uh, proxies take longer to initialize so we are looking at uh, options like improving initialization times in envoy improving uh, sidecar deploying sidecar resources to uh, configure uh, proxies to see the only the configuration that they need to look at uh, things like that so scale and high availability is going to be our uh, next immediate uh, uh, initiative uh, as i mentioned in earlier uh, we support a lot of uh, we configure services using a lot of opinionated configuration for complicated uh, setups uh, but uh, recently we've been seeing need from service owners to be able to tweak that configuration uh, for specific use cases or specific flows so we want to invest uh, in tooling that can make service owners uh, tweak specific configurations uh, without uh, involvement of mesh admins basically so we are going to focus on self more self serve this year and the new telemetry and wasm extensions we are watching them uh, wasm extensions is going to be very critical for us to improve uh, wasm filter configurations as we see more and more wasm filter adoption in uh, salesforce so we will explore those apis and adopt at the right time uh, so with that all of these things in place uh, we this year and coming year we hope to see more and more adoption onto mesh uh, lots of new use cases lots of new customers lots of new services um, we hope to share our findings in coming istiocon presentations and with that thank you very much for your attention and uh, we are open to q and a
Thank you both.